welcome to week three of an introduction to the archaeology of architecture. This week we're hopping into our first case study, uh, the Gigantia Temple on the island of Malta. Uh, I know we've gone over some concepts pertaining to archaeology and architecture over the last few weeks, such as the three F's and the idea of the palimpsest, so we're finally going to put those into practice this week. So in terms of learning objectives, I want you to first understand the geographical and historical context of the Gigantia Temple. I want to cover both the context in which the temple was constructed and also its discovery, which in turn begins a discussion regarding its archaeology. Uh, so we're going to be applying the three Fs to Gigantia and discuss architecture's role in the archaeological record, especially as it pertains to the Neolithic period. So in terms of questions this week, I want to harken back to a question I asked you last week, and that is what defines architecture? So again, I want you to kind of think about some of the examples I gave you last week. Maybe you have your own examples as well, uh, but just have that in the back of your head as we go forward here. And then the second question, again, a fairly simple question, but why do people build? And again, especially as we dive into the Neolithic here, I really want you to think about that question. Now, Malta itself is located in the Midwestern Mediterranean Sea. It's located in the strait between the southern part of Italy, that being the island of Sicily, and the northern tip of Tunisia in northern Africa. Uh, so therefore, this places it in a strategic point of access between the eastern and the western Mediterranean Sea, giving the island a very long and a very rich history. Now, in regards to Malta itself, the modern Republic of Malta consists of three main islands, Gozo, Camino, and of course Malta, and this makes it geographically what's known as an archipelago, which is a cluster of islands or a sea or stretch of water that contains multiple islands. And Gigantia, the site we're going to be looking at, uh, marked with the red star here on my map, is located on the northern part of Gozo in an area called the Zagra Plateau. And as you can see on this map as well, just to give you some more context, Gigantia is not the only megalithic temple in Malta, and there are plenty on the uh, main island as well. So these people were clearly some kind of seafarers. Most people speculate that they came from Sicily, as that is the closest land-wise. And since uh, Gigantia is one of the oldest sites we know of on the, uh, on the archipelago, it's in the northernmost part, so that's what makes the most sense in terms of the distribution of the population. And as you can see as well, the construction techniques and everything are fairly consistent, which makes this theory fairly sound. So Jigantia itself. So the temple was most likely constructed, or its initial phases anyways, around uh, 3600 to 3200 BCE. And this is uh, during a time known as the Neolithic period. So what exactly was the Neolithic period? Uh, so the word itself comes from neo meaning new and lithos meaning stone. So its literal definition is new stone age. And this period saw one of the most drastic shifts in human and societal evolution. So people ceased their hunting and gathering lifestyles and became more sedentary. Uh, they formed more permanent settlements, began farming, domestication of animals, and therefore this created a surplus that led to some of the first architectural constructions that were used as you know, a form of status, a form of ritual. And this complex um, on Gozo in Malta is one of the earliest we know of uh, in the archeological record in general. And this is second only to the site of Gobekli Tepe in Turkey, I have a picture of it here, uh, which was built around 10,000 BCE. And I wanted to mention Gobekli Tepe quickly just to kind of provide you with some insight regarding the scale of the Neolithic. So both of these structures were built in what's classified as the same time period, however, thousands of years apart. So it kind of gives you this idea of how far the Neolithic stretched and how long it took for this transition in lifestyle to occur. Now, Another thing I want you to remember going forward as we hop into Gigantia a little bit here is that every individual building usually belongs to a larger complex, a larger context. So this is especially the case here and honestly within the Neolithic in general. Now in terms of 
the site's discovery, which is the next part of the historical context. Uh, people, that being locals and travelers, knew about Gigantia prior to its discovery in the 1820s. Uh, however, in 1920, at his own expense, Colonel John Otto Bayer had the site cleared. And I use cleared, as most uh, scholarly papers will use as well, and not excavate because the site was not, in fact, excavated properly until the 20th century. So at this point, the site was simply cleared of soil and debris, most of which, except some of the notable artifacts, has since been lost to time. So hence, the only evidence that we have at the site is the architecture and the evidence from proper excavations that have been conducted since. And there are some drawings and artistic renderings like the one on the slide here, uh, which provides some insight. However, proper excavations and recording is really the cream of the crop and that just wasn't the common practice at this point in time. So going off of that quickly, this brings us back to the idea of the palimpsest uh, that we talked about last week. So this phase from the early 1820s, this layer uh, is gone. And hence, so is a portion of our understanding of the site, which, as I've already mentioned, is fairly limited to begin with. So it wasn't until 1933 uh, that the government attained the land and in tandem with the Museum Department of Malta conducted plenty of excavations over the course of the 20th century. And excavations do continue to this day. Now, in terms of its name, because, you know, I really do like etymology, so I'm going to get into that a little bit. So Gigantia's name comes from the folklore that surrounds the temple, and that the large, this is that the large stones were carried by giants, and that they were the ones who built the temple. And this is actually a fairly consistent narrative across the archipelago when it comes to the other temples um, on the main island as well. So this made me think of something that I want you as students in this archaeology related course to think about as well. Is folklore, is oral tradition an artifact? If it's all the criteria other than being a physical object, and in this instance it was integral to actually coming to know and understand the site on a more scientific level. And there's not really any right or wrong answer here, but it's just another thing I want you to think about going forward and as we start to look at more architecture, especially next week. So beyond this local knowledge and the folklore, we don't have any contemporary written records to associate with the temple. And mainly also this is because writing, as far as we know, did not exist on the island. And this is a problem with uh, the Neolithic in general, honestly. So therefore, based on this, archaeology plays a huge role in how we interpret the site. And as you can see from this uh, more modern plan on the slide here, um, more comprehensive excavations have been conducted over the last couple of years under the Fragus project. Uh, the goals of this project included gaining further understanding of some of these sites in general uh, through further excavations and test pits. Um, but the primary goal was kind of understanding how these people interacted with their environments with these sites or via these sites and also speculate perhaps why they were abandoned and what sort of environmental impact the people had, especially in an island setting. And one feature of note is this platform area in the front entrance. It was noted in that painting, in that engraving, sorry, from 1829, but it's features like this that modern archaeological practices provide better insight into, I suppose is the best way to describe it. So it, it also makes you think a little bit more about the way that the space was controlled in tandem with the, you know, main temple building, the main, you know, thing you can see on the landscape. So, you know, how many people can you fit on that platform in comparison to the temple? You know, it makes you think about these sort of things. And that brings me on to, obviously, the three Fs. So how do we apply them in this context when we don't have, you know, a piece of paper an account or some sort of inscription to tell us exactly what this was used for. In terms of form, I could get into all of the technical terms, you know, trilithic niche, uh, coralline versus globergina limestone, 
but I really just want you as students in this course to understand Gigantia in its most basic form. It's a megalithic complex, uh, meaning it's constructed of large stones, mega large lithic stone. And stone is really the only material we have in the archaeological record that is structural in nature. However, as you can see on the slide here, these post holes, and again, this harkens back to the importance of archaeology and interpretation, clearly there were more elements to the structure than what survives today. So these post holes here were most likely used to hold up some kind of perishable material that acted as a wall or another way to control the flow of people, light, and sound in the space. Now, in terms of function, <laughs> Ritual is the go-to word, and we do have evidence of sacrifice, that being animal remains. However, again, without something telling us exactly what this was used for, this could also be associated with some sort of feasting or something else involving, involving the butchering of animals. But again, this all goes back to that one word, that being ritual. Now, when it comes to this, when we don't have that, you know, piece of information telling us exactly what something was used for, how do we interpret, you know, the feeling, that aspect of the three Fs? Now, we don't know what type of feeling the building was originally meant to instill, like we did with, say, the church example I used last week. So you have to use kind of your own interpretation to speculate this aspect of the building, uh, especially when it comes to studying the architecture. So some things you can think about in terms of feeling in this regard is, you know, light, the use of light, um, how light would have flowed within the interior, uh, and, you know, the position of the temple in the landscape as a whole as well. So what feelings did the interior instill is one thing to think about. Uh, but you also need to compare this with, you know, viewing it from a distance or viewing it from the exterior from that platform area I mentioned earlier. You know, was it meant for large gatherings of people? Was it meant to store something, some sort of show? You know, these are the things you have to think about as you look at the architecture and the way the space is defined. Now, as I mentioned, these Neolithic sites, for the most part, are usually located in association with something natural. Uh, for example, Gigantia is very close to a natural spring and caves, I think, if I remember correctly, 183 meters away. And so there is another site nearby as well, the Zagra Stone Circle, and this is all within the context of the plateau itself. So one thing I really want you to think about is, does the wider context play a role in helping us determine form and function, and does feeling, or trying to interpret feeling, also help us determine form and function. Now, as I've already mentioned uh, with the three Fs, you don't necessarily have to know the answer to the question of form or function or feeling in order to apply these concepts uh, to the archeological record. At their core, I want these three points to act as a base for interpretation uh, with architecture at the center, obviously, and then other forms of uh, evidence in conjunction with that. Now, in regards to Gigantia and the Neolithic in general, I harken back to that question I asked you at the beginning of the lecture, and that is what compelled people to build these structures? Why do people build? Now, architecture, especially from the Neolithic, I think is very important because it provides us with a context in which something substantial occurred. No matter what it was for, uh, whether we can discern, you know, a structure or a feature's use via the archaeological record, the architecture itself provides a story. It provides evidence of importance. So, especially here within the Neolithic at Gigantia, people are starting to define their space, whether that's, you know, in the context of life, death, ritual, not ritual. People are starting to you know, define their space in a more permanent way, and they're starting to restrict access and control access of that space, of those rituals, of whatever is occurring inside and what they want to instill on the people who look at it from the outside. So ahead of next week, 
especially I want you to think about those points. And I also want you to think about this idea of wider context. So should architectural features, buildings, should they be interpreted alone? or within their wider context, to that being both, you know, temporal and, you know, space-wise. So, especially in regards to the Neolithic, uh, but also, you know, other time periods, do you think interpreting the architecture within that wider context hinders our understanding? Does it make it too complicated? Or does it enrich the story of that building and that site? You know, this is something I want you to think about, especially ahead of looking at the Parthenon next week. All right, so these are the sources that I used this week. If you did want to learn a little bit more about some of the other sites um, on Malta, I highly recommend checking out Heritage Malta. It's a really great resource. It's got lots of nice videos and pictures. And if you wanted to learn a little bit more about some of the uh, more modern archeological uh, excavations that are taking place under the Fragus Project, um, I highly recommend checking out this uh, chapter by Brogan et al. It's available via Google Scholar. All right, everyone, and that concludes lecture three. We are officially halfway through this course. Uh, thank you so much again for taking this course and enrolling. I really hope you're enjoying the material so far. I know I asked you a lot of questions this week, um, but that's just how I want you to be thinking about the material instead of, you know, presenting you with various forms of jargon and terminology, which I am happy to post about if you're interested, just let me know. Uh, but, you know, as we go forward, I'm going to be asking you a lot of questions and asking you to think about, you know, the use of space, the way we define space, because that's going to play directly into the final assignment, uh, which I'll be posting about in a couple of weeks. All right, so next week we're looking at the Parthenon, one of my favorite buildings, so I'm very excited for that. Uh, if you have any questions uh, or need clarification, please reach out via Google Classroom. And re always remember to check the FAQ section in week zero as well. Uh, that's it. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a great rest of your day, and I'll see you next week. Bye.